Hello everyone, welcome to the course on basic cognitive processes. I am Dr. Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur. I will be talking about memory today. Now, we have been in this course talking about uh, different cognitive phenomena and what those cognitive phenomena mean to us and how do they help us live our lives, how do they help us interact with the environment. Now, if you actually take a survey of whatever mental processes uh, one does and whatever these mental processes help us achieve in life, help us do, uh, memory uh, appears to be a very interesting one. Why? Because uh, memory is probably the all pervasive mental phenomena that is going on all the time. Today, we will try and see what memory is about. Generally, uh, if I were doing it in a classroom, I would ask you to generate a definition of memory. So, what you can do is decide how you define memory, uh, quickly uh, generate a very small maybe a one liner or a two liner definition of memory and keep it in your mind uh, while I talk to you about uh, you know uh, something uh, and how uh, formally memory has been defined. Now, I was going through uh, you know when I was going to make uh, this thing, there is this quote of uh, Tennessee Williams that I found out and Tennessee Williams says uh, very interestingly, he says, has it ever struck you that life is all memory except for the one present moment that goes by so quickly that you hardly catch it going. It is all really uh, memory except for each passing moment. Now, if I were to ask you which is that mental phenomena, which is that cognitive process that gives you the sense of self, that gives you the se that uh, sense of continuity that you are existing in this world, that you are the same person that you were yesterday and say for example, while you are planning about your future, you will be the same person that you today are. Everything that you know about this world, everything that uh, you have ever done, everything that you have ever experienced, say for example, seen, heard tasted, smelt, uh, everything that you have done uh, on the face of this earth till this particular point in time while you are watching this particular lecture is all part of your memory. Obviously, it might be different that you might recall uh, some parts of those things uh, very vividly, some of those things not so vividly, but they are still stored somewhere at the back of your brain, somewhere in, the, in your head and they form what is called memory. In this particular chapter, while talking about memory, I will talk to you about, uh, say for example, the processes that help you store this information, the processes that help you organize this information and also the processes that help you use this information to do a variety of things. Say for example, I give you a task here to add 2 plus 2 to do some multiplication or let us say to tell me a story or to, if I ask you to, uh, you know, uh, describe me what you did uh, last evening, anything that I will ask you to do will require you to draw on your memory and will require you to actually uh, you know uh, use your memory uh, to look into this uh, you know in the shelves of the memory and bring out information. Also if I do not ask you to you know uh, do any particular task, but I say for example give you an apple to eat, you will need to draw on your memory that apple is a fruit and it is edible to actually act on that particular apple. Again, you are using some of your knowledge, something that is there, some part which is uh, you know obviously part of your entire larger memory system uh, to be able to do anything that you would want to do. A lot of people would say that even processes like thinking and you know dreaming and desiring have a lot to do with your memory. Whatever experiences you had over time, how have you organized those experiences, which of the experiences, which of the you know events uh, you have found that uh, were very important to you uh, have still uh, you know uh, been kept almost as vivid. Say for example, I uh, you know ask you to uh, describe to me uh, you know a, a vacation or a holiday that you spent at least 5 years or 10 years ago and uh, tell me in great detail about what you did during that vacation. If that holiday uh, were uh, you know a particularly uh, pleasant or even in some sense uh, uh, unpleasant experience, if it were salient and if it were distinguishable for all the mundane uh, everyday activities, it is quite possible that even though the holiday is 10 years or 15 years or in 20 years uh, back from now, you might be able to uh, you know uh, 
recall it, you might be able to really, uh, vividly relive it uh, in the current moment by drawing upon your memory. So, in this chapter, we will be uh, spending a lot of time about uh, you know talking about different aspects of memory. Uh, in the first uh, few lectures, I will be talking to you about uh, a particular model of memory that was given by Atkinson and Schiffering, wherein they basically divided memory into sensory and short term and working memory. We will talk about that. We will going further talk about uh, you know long term memory as well, uh, which is basically about the information that you have uh, you had kept for a longer time. We will be talking about errors in memory, we will be talking about what does the brain have to do with memory, what happens with uh, when a particular area of the brain is not responding. We will be doing all of that in the course of the next few lectures and uh, basically trying to understand how memory as a cognitive function uh, really helps us uh, you know find that sense of continuity of life, find that sense of uh, you know being uh, who we are. So, with that kind of background with that kind of you know informalish uh, background, uh, let us try and define what memory is. I am hoping that you had kept a two liner definition in your mind and I am now uh, asking you to match that definition with the definition I am giving up here. So, my definition of memory again uh, may be picked up from a particular book is that memory is the process involved in retaining retrieving and using information about stimuli, images, events, ideas, skills uh, and a lot of things you might add after the original information is no longer present. So, that moment has passed that stimuli is not in front of you anymore or say for example, that stimuli has come to you after a long time all of these things uh, how do you retain that information, how do you retrieve that information from the back of your mind and how do you start using that information. Suppose you met uh, somebody you know two years ago on a particular railway platform or maybe in a theatre and now you meet him right in front of your house doing something and you kind of realize Acha, this is the person I know and you are kind of going to talk to this person. So, all of those kind of things everything in that sense that you are going to do will draw upon your memory. Now, there is an interesting case uh, of uh, a patient called Clive Wearing. he is probably referred to as the 10 seconds man uh, or the 7 seconds man, you can find uh, you know a, a video documentary of his uh, on uh, YouTube. Clive Wearing was a man, basically he had uh, you know uh, a particular kind of amnesia, a disorder of memory where he could not recall anything uh, for more than a matter of 10 seconds. Now, Clive Wearing is maintaining a particular diary and uh, one of these people uh, went through his diaries and there is an excerpt, uh, there is a description uh, you know of his diary right here, I will just read it to you to give you a perspective of what uh, happens when memory is actually not around, when memory kind of gets damaged in a particular way. So, this feeling of that loss of continuity, this feeling of loss of uh, the sense of selfhood uh, can really exist, which is uh, you know made uh, really abundantly clear by if somebody goes through Clive Wearing's diary and it contains hundreds of entries, it contains hundreds of entries and I am quoting, I have woken up for the first time or I am alive or things like that he has no memory of who he is, he has no memory of any past, he has no hopes of remembering anything in the uh, future uh, and those kind of things. What does uh, he do? How, do, how does he maintain his diet? It is a very interesting documentary, I am sure you will find it on YouTube if you look uh, for it. So, Clive Wearing has no memory of ever writing anything except for the sentence that he has just written. So, you give him his diary that uh, you have been maintaining this diary all while long and he will turn through those pages as if it is some stranger's diary, as if it, he is saying that uh, you know uh, seeing that diary for the first time, as if he is writing anything ever for the first time. People have tried to question Clive Wearing, people have tried to question him about these uh, you know previous entries and Wearing then acknowledges that they are in his handwriting. So, he remembers this is my handwriting, but because he has no memory of writing them, he denies that they are his. So, even something that is happening right in front of you, imagine if you cannot really recognize that is it you or is it somebody else or you know does it really belong to you, that is that kind of uh, is, is a very major setback. Now, uh, it is no wonder you know if somebody has that kind of a memory loss uh, and the kind of loss that Wearing is having, he is really confused and is not surprising that he describes as being like death. His loss of memory has robbed him of his ability to participate in life in any meaningful way and he needs to be constantly cared for by others. So, memory in that sense is that 
cognitive function uh, if I uh, may take the liberty of saying so on which all the other cognitive functions are actually based and are uh, function it is like you know the operating system is like the uh, background against which all the other uh, cognitive and mental activities are taking place and everything is uh, taking place in this uh, you know in the reference or in the frame of this particular memory. So, in that sense I think I have talked enough about how uh, important memory is uh, you know uh, as a cognitive functions and I think that will be reflected in the amount of time we kind of uh, are going to talk about memory and the different aspects of memory uh, in uh, you know um, this part of the course. Now, uh, if I again simplify uh, and if I structure, uh, try and structure this memory for uh, you, uh, how would you, uh, you know, really organize memory? A very simple way of uh, saying this is uh, using the help of English, they could be the present uh, or the present tense say, for example, this movement uh, or this moment and the moment and actually just passed as I was saying it. So, the past is already as recent. So, that moment, the one uh, that passed uh, and the long past will be that moment say, for example, when I had begun this lecture. So, memory in that sense can be organized into present and past and something that is long past. Okay, because memory is only about things that you have already experienced, it does not really have that uh, you know any sense of future or uh, thinking or something like that. Now, here is the flow diagram of uh, Atkinson and Schifrin's model of memory and this model uh, again this figure is uh, drawn from Goldstein's book on cognitive psychology. Uh, herein you can see uh, there are three aspects of memory that Atkinson and Schifrin define. They say uh, there is at least three parts to memory. The first part is sensory memory. So, as you are experiencing the world through your five senses, there is information that is imprinting, impinging on these senses and while this information is impinging on your senses, you might have a recollection of them and that is what is your sensory memory. It is very, very uh, little and we will talk about this, uh, this pan and those kind of things in today's lecture at a later point in time. The second important aspect of uh, you know memory that uh, Atkinson and Schifrin define is the short term memory wherein some information for a very short term you probably want to do something with that information use it in some particular way. The third is long term memory things which have you have experienced long back and not really uh, very long back things like starting from you know a uh, few minutes to few hours to few decades. And you will see uh, that there is a constant uh, you know uh, give and take between short term memory and long term memory. Say for example, today I ask you about your address, about where you are living or where you are living 5 years ago, you will draw that information from your long term memory, bring it to the short term memory and give me a particular output. So, you will see the output is linked to short term memory, anything uh, that is performative, anything that you are doing in this world will draw on what is called your short term memory. Input is uh, first uh, addressed at the sensory stage, so that is your sensory memory. So, Richard Atkinson and uh, Schifrin, they gave this model in 1968 and this model was referred to as the modal model of memory because it included almost everything or almost the different kinds of features that were present in memory models of those days. This model had been extremely influential and kind of shaped and gave direction to memory research for a lot of years, for uh, many years uh, that were to come. Now, the stages in this uh, model uh, are called structural features. So, these are components of memory uh, so to speak. So, the first component is sensory memory. Sensory memory is that initial stage that holds all the incoming information from the senses. Remember, I have not talked about attention yet. So, I am talking about all the information that is coming in that stays for around almost just a fraction of a second or just a few seconds. This is what is your sensory memory. From sensory memory, if you for example, attend some information, it goes to your short term memory, it is held there for around 15 to 30 seconds and it has a very small capacity of around 5 to 7 items. So, how the sensory information is passing from the sensory memory coming to your short term memory for further processing, but it still stays there for not, for not more than 15 to 30 seconds. The important part, the part on which we draw upon for uh, doing anything is called the long term memory. The long term memory can hold a large amount of information over years, decades, you know if I if you were say for example, uh, 25 years of age, if I ask you things that uh, happened to you while you were 5 years of age, you will at least remember some salient things, maybe you will remember uh, something very specific from your childhood, that where has, where has it been all the while, because you are not constantly thinking of that thing while you are living your life. So, it was tucked away very safely, very uh, you know uh, 
in a very well organized way in somewhere uh, in the back of your memory uh, uh, scope or memory store and given a particular uh, cue, given a reason to recall it, you will certainly recall it. So, that is what long term memory is, there is no uh, real uh, you know uh, not a lot of studies done about the uh, you know limitation of size in this long term memory, but certainly uh, any information past 30 seconds or past 1 minute till uh, you know maybe the time since you were born is all there in your long term memory. Now, Atkinson and Schifrin also described the memory system as including what are called control processes. So, they said this, there are these control processes which are active and they can be controlled by the person and then may differ from one task to the others. If I am giving you a particular task uh, to remember something, to remember a set of digits, to remember a particular uh, number of words or sentences, you might engage in what is called rehearsal. What is rehearsal? Rehearsal is simply what uh, people do, uh, repeating a stimulus over and over again as one might repeat a telephone number say for example, in order to hold it in one's memory. Uh, and so that one does not have to look in the phone book. Okay. So, for example, if you are uh, on phone, somebody is telling you a particular number, you cannot find that paper, you might want to keep repeating that number till the time that you get a uh, you know, paper or pen or say for example, till after you have cut the call and you can save that in your mobile phone. Let us take an, uh, you know, an active example uh, again borrowed from Goldstein's book. Say for example, there is a girl called Rachel and she wants to uh, you know, look up a pizzeria uh, in order to ask for a pizza. Uh, so, what she would do is she goes on the internet, she looks on the screen, all of the information that uh, enters her eyes is registered in what is called the sensory memory. So, if you are looking at a particular page on the internet, you kind of all of that uh, you know, uh, sentences and everything is coming into your eyes, that is what is called the sensory memory every information is getting registered is the sensory memory. Now, she has to use the control process of selective attention because she wants to look for a particular pizzeria or she wants say she gets attracted by a unique name of a particular pizzeria. So, she does that, she focuses on one particular number and because she is focusing on this particular number, this has entered what is called her short term memory. Later, she knows that she might need to call number again uh, to order the pizza next time and again she does not want to go to the internet and do that process again. So, what she does is she decides that in addition to storing the number in her phone, she is going to memorize the number. Maybe there is somebody uh, you know who uh, would want to uh, remember information as well. So, she kind of tries to memorize this thing. So, what she does is she does some rehearsal, she processes uh, you know, th the process that she will use uh, to uh, keep this number via rehearsal is referred to as encoding. So, what she is doing is by rehearsal, she is encoding this information, storing it somewhere in her brain, so that she can you know call uh, that number back to ask for the pizza. So, a few days later, she wants to order pizza again, she will need to retrieve this number again from her long term memory and dial that particular number. So, again a graphic here, uh, panels A, B, C and D, uh, panel A she is actually looking through for the numbers in the, they are there in the sensory memory, panel B she is focusing on a specific number uh, which then enters the short term memory, uh, panel C she is rehearsing to encode that number in the long term memory, so that she can call upon that number at a later point in time. So, here is via rehearsal information grows from the short term memory to the long term memory and it stays there becomes part of whatever that large storage uh, thing is for. So, she needs to call the pizza next time, the other day maybe next week, then she can from her memory recall and use that uh, number to dial for a pizza. Obviously, she can look in the phone as well, but maybe say for example, if uh, you know she wants to recall and use it, she has at least memorized the number, maybe uh, she has to tell it to somebody or something like that. Okay. So, here you saw uh, how a very simple task of looking uh, for a pizzeria, calling it does involve all three kinds of your memory. It involves control processes like selective attention and rehearsal and using these control processes that is how you deal with the information that you are getting uh, from the environment uh, most times. It could be any other example, it could be an example with meeting somebody and those kind of things. Let us now talk about sensory memory. Sensory memory, I will be going to each of these processes now in uh, some detail, so that we uh, kind of understand them in more uh, uh, in, in a much better sense. Uh, 
So sensory memory is the retention time is uh, for very brief periods of time uh, of the effects of sensory stimulation. So sensory memory is the retention for brief periods of time of the effects of sensory stimulation. If you see something, if you see, hear a uh, fading voice, if say for example you, uh, you see a, a moving sparkler, I think uh, we uh, have done it a lot in uh, Diwali or some kind of festivals. If you actually take the sparkler and if you kind of uh, move it around, you will see this wave of uh, smoke that gets formed and you kind of remember that uh, wave of uh, smoke and that is basically what has registered on your sensory memory. Now, as you swing this, uh, something that I already talked about, so as you swing the, uh, swing the sparkler through the air, creating a trail of light, you would realize that there is actually no light present at that point along this trail. You are moving this, you are seeing that there is light moving, but you have actually uh, moved the sparkler away from that position, you still see that trail of light. That trail of light being there, because you are seeing it, uh, is basically referred to as persistence of vision. So, even though the lighted, uh, lighted trail is not there, is a creation, this is uh, the one which you are seeing right away, is the creation of your own mind and this retention of that visual perception is called persistence of vision. You might see that in some time, say for example, it might also happen that, you know, somebody said something to you and he's gone away, but you know, that voice keeps ringing in your ears, that is probably persistence of uh, auditory information. Similarly, say for example, uh, let us take this example, if you are watching a movie in a darkened theatre, you may see actions moving smoothly across the screen, but what is actually projected on the screen is quite different. What is projected on the screen basically is a single frame and then the other frame and then the other frame in quick succession from each other, but what you see uh, because of this uh, persistence of vision is a continuous movie. So, a single frame is positioned in the front of the projector lens, then when the projector shutter opens, the image on the film flashes on the screen, the shutter then closes, so the film can move on to the next frame. So, basically it is frame by frame, you are being shown particular stills, but if all of those stills are shown, uh, are shown in a particular, uh, you know, uh, sequence, say for example, what is called frame rates uh, per second, FPS, then what you will see is you will see a particular movie. When the next frame has arrived in the front of the lens, the shutter reopens, the flashing the next image on the screen uh, and it kind of happens around 24 times per second. So, 24 images are flashed on the screen every second repeated by a brief period of darkness, but you do not see the darkness, you do not notice that these are separate frames and in that sense, you basically are uh, using this persistence of vision to construct uh, out of your own mind what a movie is like. So, a person viewing the film does not really notice this dark intervals between the images because of persistence of vision and because this persistence of vision fills these uh, gaps of darkness which are there between the changes of each frame. Now, I will describe to you a very interesting experiment that is kind of drawing on this uh, particular phenomena. Uh, George Sperling in 1960, he wondered how much information people can take in from very briefly presented stimuli. So, he determined this in a famous experiment in which what he did was he flashed an array of letters on the screen for around 50 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds is a much uh, smaller uh, time period and then asked his participants to report as many of the letters as he can. So, this part of the experiment was called the whole report method. So, the idea is some uh, array of letters will be flashed for around 50 milliseconds and the participant will be asked to report this, the number of letters, the number of uh, uh, digits that they actually see. So, given this task, what happened was that the participants were able to report on an average around 4.5 letters out of the 12 letters. So, this is how it was done. If you can see at the uh, first panel, the whole report panel, there were uh, three rows of four letters each and every time the participant is uh, just being able to tell about four or five letters. So, in the next version what he decided, he decided to use what is called the partial report method. So, what he did was he presented the matrix for 50 milliseconds before, but he sounded one of the following tones after the matrix presentation to indicate which row of letters the participants were to report. So, if it were a high pitched tone, then it were the top row that they had to report. If it were a medium pitched tone, then they had to report the middle row. If there is a low pitched tone, they had to talk about the lowest row. 
Because the tones were presented after the letters turned off, the participants attention was uh, di directed not to the actual letters because they have come and gone, but to the persistence, but to the trace of uh, you know of those letters that are remaining in these participants minds uh, once the letters have been turned off. So, this is an example of what the uh, partial report method was like. What do you predict would have happened? When the cue tones directed the participants to focus their attention on one of the rows, they correctly reported an average of 3.3 .3 or uh, 4 out of 4 letters in a row. So, the accuracy uh, and the amount of the, uh, the information they could now report has been enhanced uh, quite a lot because they are being told to focus on a very limited uh, span of information. So, Sperling concluded from this experiment that the correct description of what was happening was that immediately after the display was presented, participants saw an average about of 82 percent of the letters in the whole display, but they were not able to report all of those letters because they rapidly faded away after the initial letter was being reported. So, Sperling then uh, he does an additional experiment to determine the time course of this fading. So, he wanted to check what is the time course in which this information fades away. So, for this Sperling devised a delayed partial report method uh, in which the presentation of tones was delayed for a fraction of a second after the letters extinguished. So, basically uh, it is about giving them time to rehearse this uh, thing. So, the result of this delayed partial report method was that when the Q tones were delayed for one second after the flash, participants were uh, able to report only slightly more than one letter in a row the equivalent of about 4 letters for all 3 rows and the same number of letters they reported using the whole uh, report method. So, if there is this time gap between the tone and the presentation of letters, then the participant uh, is not being able to report it. So, here is uh, the delayed partial report method. So, this is wherein you can see that from whole report to partial report to delayed, uh, the whole report is the lowest at the right part and the partial report is uh, around in the middle and the uh, accuracy is much better. So, Sperling concluded from these results that a short lived sensory memory register operates uh, or uh, registers all or most of the information that first hits our visual receptors but that this information decays within less than a second. So, if the tone is coming uh, one second later than the presentation of this, participants do not have any clue of which information they have to report. So, their uh, reporting time or accuracy kind of goes up to what the whole report method was like. So, this brief sensory memory for visual stimuli has been referred to as iconic memory and it corresponds to the sensory memory for vision and it kind of uh, falls in the sensory memory stage of Atkinson and Schiffner's model. Other research has also been done using auditory stimuli and it has been shown that sound also persists in mind, but the persistence of this is, uh, is referred to as the echoic memory. It kind of lasts for a few seconds after the presentation of the original stimulus. In that sense, the range of uh, echoic memory or auditory sensory memory is slightly longer than that of visual sensory memory or iconic memory. Now, the sensory memory register can register huge amounts of information, but it retains this information only for very few seconds or fractions of a second. Many cognitive psychologists believe that the sensory store is important for at least three things. First is collecting the information that has to be processed. Second is holding the information briefly while the initial process is going on. And third is fill in the blanks when the stimulus is interpreted. So, something that was happening in uh, frame rates and while uh, you watch a particular movie. Sperling's experiment is important not only because it reveals the capacity of one, uh, the capacity of sensory memory because it is much larger and its duration which is much briefer, but also it provides yet another demonstration of how a clever experimentation can actually uh, you know tell you something very important about this cognitive and mental phenomena. This is all about sensory memory. In the next lecture, I will talk to you about short term memory.